Peter Rabel, one of those larger-than-life Unitarian Universalist ministers of a bygone generation, wrote these words from which I've taken the title of the sermon this morning. Peter Rabel wrote, We build on foundations we did not lay, warm ourselves by fires we did not light, sit in the shade of trees we did not plant, and drink from wells we did not dig. We profit from persons we did not know, and this is as it should be. For together we are more than any one person could be. Together we can build across the generations. Together we can renew our hope and faith in the life that is yet to unfold. And together we can heed the call to a ministry of care and of justice. We are ever bound in community, may it always be so. On those days during the year when we welcome new members into the church community, I find it fitting to offer some words about membership, about what it means to belong to the church, and what it means for the church to belong to you. Because the church, after all, does belong to the members of the church. I've got a few different reflections on this subject I'd like to share this morning. And the first one sort of comes from those wonderful words by Peter Abel. What I like about his words, about drinking from wells we did not dig, is that it reminds us, helps us to remember that this faith and this church is a gift. Think back to the first time you came to church. There was a seat in the pews for you that someone had put there waiting for you to sit down in it. There was an order of service for you, and a hymnal. There was a cup of coffee for you in coffee hour. And if there weren't those things on the particular Sunday when you visited for the first time, there should have been. <laughs> but more than that, there were hymns, and songs, and sacred music, and sacred texts, that expressed our ideals and captured our longings. There was a theological tradition that had wrestled with important questions. There was a long history of ethical engagement to serve as a source of inspiration. And as I'm finding, there is also a tradition, a tradition of, that teaches us how to respond and how to live authentically in challenging times. When any of us walked through the doors for the first time, we encountered these fires we did not light, this shade of trees we did not plant, this quenching water of wells we did not dig. And there is, on our part, there's different ways that we might respond to these gifts. One response, one I don't recommend, is to take it for granted enjoying what is offered without doing anything to make sure that it continues to be. Another approach is to approach these gifts as a transaction, attempt to calculate what our fair share of the cost of them are, and to repay it. Sometimes it can even be tempting to act like these gifts belong to us exclusively, and feel like we must guard it from others who might want to take it away from us. But there's another way, a way that I do commend to you, which is to respond by carefully tending the fires that were burning when we already arrived, to plant new trees, to provide shade for future generations, to dig deeper wells, to ensure that when our lives are over, there will still be warmth and shade and quenching waters for people we will never meet, and the great-grandchildren of people we will never meet. Early in my first ministry, serving what was then a much smaller church, I became curious about a member of the church I had never met before. Not only did I not know who this person was, which was rare in a smaller church, but I asked around, and nobody else seemed to know either. 
She was a mystery. But every month, like clockwork, a very generous check would arrive from her to the church. And so I decided one day that I would call her up to thank her, but also to invite her to come to church. <laughs> and so I did. I, I called her, and we talked for a little while, and I asked, I asked her whether she might ever want to come to church, and she told me, oh, no. I'm not much of a churchgoer, and I can't think of anything that I need. I just think that what the church does is important, and it's important for me to know it's out there. Sometimes we profit from persons we do not know. <laughs> I tell this story not to recommend this approach to membership to you. <laughs> Though to be honest, I would certainly not complain if anyone in the wider community decided to emulate this person. I tell this story because it's in some sense it captures some aspects of those words by Peter Ripple. I'm grateful. I'm deeply grateful for every single person who, for example, to choose one ministry completely by random, for every person who volunteers with the high school youth group. But there's always that little bit of extra wow when I consider the person who works with the high school youth group even though their child graduated from the program long ago, or who comes every Sunday night when they themselves don't even have children. There is this sense in which the church, our experience with it is not necessarily transactional, but can be kind of just mysterious. I have a mystery, mysterious story from my own life um, that I continue to ask myself about. When I was 19, I decided one day that I would join the caring ministry of my home church. And I have no idea why I decided to do that. I did find the experience deeply meaningful, but it wasn't like I sat down and said one day, I want to have a deeply meaningful experience. Here's how I just sort of called them up. I do remember that I was the youngest person on the committee by five decades. <laughs> And I was assigned, I was assigned to visit a man named Ernie. In his mid-80s, he lived in his house alone. His eyesight was failing, his hands shook. He had given up driving. His wife had recently moved out and been moved into a nursing home 10 miles away for her health to be tended to. And so I would come over and drive Ernie to visit his wife and we'd go out for chicken salad sandwiches at the local diner, and we played pool at the local senior center where there was this exquisite pool table that was completely unused. And Ernie, it turns out, had been a pool shark in his younger years. <laughs> and I had spent too much time at the campus pool hall my first year in college, and it did not turn me into a good player. And Ernie, though mostly blind and unsteady and somewhat forgetful, beat me every single time. <laughs> Except for those times that he let me win. I got a call from my minister that summer. He said, I've heard you've joined the caring ministry. Yes. Are we paying you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Answer that. No, I said. And there was a puzzle silence as he was trying to figure out what in the world had led me to volunteer. And I was actually figuring out as well what had led me to volunteer. And finally, I just said, it's just something I decided to do, and I'm not really sure why. The next thing I want to say about membership is that it seems to me that it's possible to regard membership as a spiritual practice. We engage in spiritual practices, whatever they may be, as a way of reminding ourselves that there is another way, another way to live, another way to think, another way to be in this world. We engage in spiritual practice as a way of reminding ourselves that there is value outside of what the world seems to value. 
If we are anxious, spiritual practice can help us to quiet and calm ourselves. If we are bitter, spiritual practice can return us to gratitude. If we are angry, spiritual grounding can help us to do something productive with that energy. If we are afraid and in despair, it can help point us in a new direction. So what do I mean when I say that membership can be a form of spiritual practice? Here's what I think I mean. When you're trying a new practice, it doesn't have to be a spiritual practice, but we'll use a spiritual practice for this. When you're trying a new practice, whatever it is, there's often an initial excitement, a period of thinking, wow, this is so cool. And then comes a plateau. And all of a sudden, what was so infatuating becomes suddenly repetitive and it loses some of its shine. But then, if you kind of stick with it, you know that there are deeper levels that one reaches after a lot of work and practice and repetition and discipline and commitment. I think the musicians know this, right? There's this period where after some after time, you, you suddenly have a breakthrough. On one level, I'm saying is that you tend to get out of church what you put into it, but also that over time, over time there can come a depth of relationships, a depth of care, a depth of meaning, a depth of connection that can be truly transformative in our lives. Writer Anne Lamott says, when I was at the end of my rope, the people at St. Andrew tied a knot in it for me and helped me to hold on. The church became my home in that old meaning of home, that it's where when you show up, they have to let you in. They let me in. They even said, you come back. So the first thought I have about membership is to remember that we drink from wells we did not dig. The second thing about membership is that it can be like a spiritual practice in that it bears fruits of meaning, connection, and transformation, and that those fruits take time and effort and practice. And there's a third thing I want to say about membership, and that is that a church is made up of imperfect people, so you should not expect perfection. There's a minister right now who's very popular. Her name is Nadia Holes Weber. She is an ordained Lutheran minister, um, but she is kind of countercultural. She's not your typical, uh, what you assume a minister is like. So she's covered in tattoos. She's got two full sleeves of tattoos and, and a big tattoo kind of right in the center of her chest. And she has, her liturgical garments are designed so that the tattoos actually show. Um, not, not covered up. And she has this hipster punk hairdo, and she swears a lot. <laughs> she like that. She's got a mouth that has some words that come out of it. <laughs> and she founded this church in Colorado, partially because as of this, she's, a, she's a best selling author. She founded this church in Colorado, which she calls, I love this name, House for All Sinners and Saints. I like community church better. <laughs> but I like house for all sinners and saints almost as much. And here's what she says when they welcome new members into their church. It is my practice, she says, to welcome new people to the church by making sure you know that the house for all sinners and saints will at some point let you down, that I will say or do something stupid and disappoint you, and then I encourage you to decide before that even happens if you will stick around after it happens. If you leave, you will miss the way that God's grace comes in and fills in the cracks left behind by our brokenness. And that, that is too beautiful to miss. A church is a holy place, but it is also a human 
place that includes human foibles, failings, weaknesses, lapses, and just all that stuff that comes with being human. But it also has love and humor and care and compassion and forgiveness and beauty and tears of joy and tears of sadness and the willingness to hold each other in the hardest of times has all that stuff that can fill our life with meaning and depth. So whether you're a brand new member or a longtime member somewhere in between or a person contemplating whether someday you might want to become a member of this church, I invite you to remember these three things. First, in a church, we benefit from things we did not create. We drink from wells we did not dig, and our response to that ought to be to make sure that those wells can quench the thirst of others. In church, membership can be a kind of spiritual practice, which means a practice through highs and lows, receiving from it in proportion, but somehow greater than what we put into it. And ultimately, the church is made up of people. A place of human failings, yes, but also human miracles. Human miracles that are too good to miss. I am so glad that you are here. I love you. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 145 as tranquil streams, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and sing. Thank you.